section of our flower here. So we can take a look at the location of that ovary relative to the other flowering parts. And what you'll see is this ovary is placed above um, where our other flowering parts are coming out versus being uh, down, in, uh, down in here. And so uh, our ovary is superior. It's above uh, the other flowering parts. We would call this a superior ovary, not an inferior ovary. So based on all that, we can go with flowers not in umbels to be, or occasionally so, ovary superior. Pistols often greater than one or with greater than one seed per cell. We could probably see that in our dissection here too. Okay, our next couplet says, petals conspicuously lobed. Well, here's our petal, and it's not at all conspicuously lobed. So with that in mind, we're gonna be ready to flip the page to go to lead 5A in subgroup 6E, or 5B in uh, 6E. 5B, petals not lobed. 7A, sepals 2 to 3. Well, we were just looking at the flower. Get a good look at those sepals there. And we counted them right at the beginning. You have five nice sepals. So we can go with sepals generally equal the petals. And you can read the rest of that couplet to make sense of uh, what we're doing here. I'll repeat that uh, when you're going through these keys, you want to make sure to read the entire couplet. For brevity, I'm sometimes just reading the start, but as you key, you should make sure the entire couplet matches what you're looking at. 8a, flowers with greater than 15 stamens or greater than one pistil, often both. We don't like that. We already counted our number of stamens and we saw that we could only see five in here, which might be visible in this little flower I've got here. One, two, three, four, five. There they are. So we're going to go all the way down to 8B. Flowers with less than 15 stamens and only one pistil. 13a looks good at first, petals five, but this is why we need to read the whole couplet. The largest one adnate to the calyx, the other four alternate with the five stamens at summit of, stam of uh, staminal tube, pistil one carpellated, one to two seeded, leaves pinnately compound, inflorescence uh, spicate. Okay, this is taking us to the P family, the Fabaceae, which can occasionally be actinomorphic, though they're better known for non-actinomorphic uh, uh, flowers, more zygomorphic looking flowers. When we look here at our flower, um, our largest one would have had to been adnate to uh, the calyx. And of course, we don't have a largest one, all our petals are, sim are similar. So we have five, but we don't have a largest one adnate to the calyx, that won't work. Um, and this is a classic Hitchcock um, other than couplet. Petals not arranged as above, pistil, leaves, and inflorescence diverse. In other words, just otherwise. 14a. 14a is asking us, is our flower perigenous or epigenous? And you'll remember that perigenous or epigenous has to do with a flower that has a uh, inferior or partially inferior ovary versus hypogenous. Um, which is a superior uh, ovary. And in our case, we've already determined we have a very clearly superior or hypogenous ovary, and so we can go with flowers hypogenous. Flowers apetalous, meaning lacking petals for 17a. That's not true. Um, our stamens match, but this does not match. So we're gonna go to 16b, petals present. Flowers often showy, stamens five, uh, occasionally five or six to 15, okay. Now we have 19a, carpels five or two to eight, one seated, <clears throat> weakly conate around the elongate tapered receptacle, which extends above the carpels, flowers separating and maturity, the persistent style twisting upwards along the persistent 
beak-like receptacle. Well, let's take a look at the image here. Sometimes there are really nice images in Hitchcock. And this one has a particularly nice image which can really help us in our identification. That probably is starting to look to us quite a bit like our plant. And in fact, it is. 19A is the correct couplet. Now, in order to get there, we have to go back to our dissection of the ovary, though, because the couplet here asked us to look at the carpels and see that they are one seated, weakly conate around an elongate, tapered receptacle, which extends above uh, the carpels. So before we'd done a cross section of the flower uh, longitudinally, so we could look and see it, uh, see the ovary and its position with regard to the other flower parts. Um, but when we look for carpels, we have to look at other clues. The carpel is the number, carpels are the number of ancestral leaves that are involved in uh, forming um, the ovary and the sections within the ovary. Here, I'm holding a flower. It's a little blurry for you. Holding a couple flowers here, actually. A little blurry. In which you can see um, pretty clearly that there are five stigma lobes right at the tip. You see those one, two, three, four, five pink lobes. And again, you can see them here. That's a pretty good indication of our number of carpels. Um, but another way to get at looking at the number of carpels would be to take a different type of cross-section of the ovary cutting across here. So uh, I've done that a little bit on a neighboring flower and then looked inside. You'll have to do this for yourself on your own with your own hand lens. When I take that cross-section um, on my uh, individual, uh, individual, I can clearly see uh, five some of this sort of thing can be really hard to see uh, without your own magnifying glass, and so you're going to want to sort this out for yourself. In mine, I can make out five divisions or five single seeds in the cross section there, suggesting uh, a match with the description. It's going to be a little hard to see in this video because lacking uh, complete magnification. Um, we can't see it. In general, we're going to better match um, the description here for uh, carpels five or occasionally two to eight, maybe uh, one seeded. That's what I see inside mine. Um, and um, weakly conate around an elongate tapered receptacle makes sense um, if you take a close look at that. And especially if you see this in fruit, you're going to see this. Uh, really clearly uh, because of the way that uh, the fruit in this particular family, uh, which is going to be geraniaceae here, uh, tend to peel off um, off the side of the style there. And so they, they come off, uh, there'll be five uh, little seeds um, on peeling sections of a style that will come off. And if you get a really close look at the developing ovary, you'll actually see these kind of five divisions here without even doing the cross section. So that's what to look for. If you don't see it on the first plant, keep looking at additional ones and uh, see if you can find them. Um, it should land you here regardless. Uh, this is a better option than uh, 19B and uh, we'll go straight to geraniaceae. As I've said before, often when you get to the family, it's a good idea to go through and read the entire family description. I'm not going to do that today to save time, and we're going to jump straight into the key, but please do that on your own. In the key, my first choice is between two genera, 1A and 1B. Both of them lead to a different uh, genera within the geranium family. 1A asks if the leaves are pinnately compound, where you have a central uh, rach rachis and then you have leaflets coming off of that. Or if they're 1B asks, are they palmately compound coming off like a palm? And we have a clear choice with our plant. We have pinnately compound leaves. Fertile stamens, five. We saw that. Um, the fruit and style separating from the top of the styler column and becoming uh, tightly twisted along its axis upon drying. Um, these erodiums have a really interesting... Um, fruit pattern that you'll start to see now that we're getting far enough into the spring um, 
we're looking at about mid-April right now when I'm recording this, and I'm already starting to see this beaked fruit, um, which is pretty fantastic. So, now that we know the genus, Arodium, we can go over to the key for Arodium, which uh, thankfully, thankfully is a very uh, short key. The first couplet says, leaves simple, panatophid, um, so divided, but simple, not, uh, the leaflets are not extending all the way to the midrib here and, uh, and forming true leaflets. They're just strongly divided, um, more deeply dissected upwards. Um, this would be, um, in disturbed areas, which fits, but it's an uncommon Mediterranean introduced species and the leaves don't really match, uh, what we were looking at for our, for our plant. Um, our plant has these deeply lobed leaves. So we can say our leaves are truly pinnately compound. We have true leaflets coming off of that uh, midrib. The leaflets are distinct. Um, the maricarp is uh, four to seven millimeters with a beak one to six centimeters. We may not be able to determine that with these individual flowers, but you can come back to a plant through time. Um, so this is going to key out to a very common Eurasian introduced widespread uh, weed. You find this all the way down into the Sonoran Desert and all the way up here into the Northwest, both sides of the Cascades. Uh, Arodium Secutarium, a uh, wonderful little uh, herb um, uh, to see in spring, even though it is introduced, it's just a, it's a beautiful little plant. Um, and then there's a number of other subspecies here that you can key out. Um, and so I'll leave that to um, leave that to you. Um, there is another option here we could have gone with, which would be 2B leaflets mostly divided, um, less than halfway to mid vein. Um, apical pit americarp with sessile glands. Um, this is another potential um, plant that you could have found, um, and so it's it's good to read through that description too and see why it doesn't exactly match that. Okay, that's it for today.